Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hanning here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos Reyes and Christopher Zender. Today we discuss how an international vision and a commitment to life, justice, and peace translate into a leadership role in the American Solidarity Party. Our special and welcome guest is Tony Guidotti. He holds a Master's of Global Affairs degree from the University of Notre Dame. Tony has worked with Catholic Relief Services and Food for the Poor. He's Interim Executive Director of the American Solidarity Party. Let's begin as we always do in prayer. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Tony, could you please tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah. So my name is Tony Gudati. I'm originally from Minnesota. I end up attending the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I triple majored in economics, international studies, and justice and peace studies. And um, I am a convert to Catholicism. I, my conversion occurred while I was in school, and it was really through my conversion that I, I heard this call and felt this vocation um, to work for international peace and, and justice around the world. Um, following my graduation, I did a program where I worked in a different country each month in the developing world for a month, and some of them doing more humanitarian work and some of them doing more ministry-oriented work. And kind of through that, ended up um, when I returned to the United States, moving just north of Seattle, um, where I worked as a youth minister for a number of years. And it's out here that I met my wife and kind of my wife gave me the, the kick in the pants that I needed to go on and, and go to, to graduate school, which is where I went to Notre Dame, um, studied global affairs with a concentration in sustainable development and a second concentration in global public policy. Following graduate school, I did, um, I was an innovation fellow, which really is municipal consulting. So I was helping a city, I, I was a lead author on a, on a city's housing plan. And I also helped design a program for our county to administer CARES Act funding for rental assistance. And so that's kind of what I was doing up until I became interim executive director. You know, that gives us a, a good picture. And I know that Mario, as our most global panelist, will want to move ahead. Well, uh... I, it's very interesting your background, but uh, I wonder what led you to, what led you to study global affairs and what is global affairs by the way? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a good question. You know, and I don't, I don't, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it's, you think we have terms that are so foundational that we don't even dive in and say, what even is this? Um, so I think that, you know, Notre Dame, when they, created the Keough School of Global Affairs, and it's, it was actually the first new school at Notre Dame in over 100 years. They really said they didn't want to just be international relations. They didn't just want to be public policy, but they did want to say in global affairs. And so global affairs, at least in the, the eyes of the program that, that I participated in, is a fusion between international peace studies, kind of this global institutions policy making and then sustainable development. And even, and even that term sustainable development meant very different things to different people in the, in the program, whether for some, you know, it's thinking about growth in terms of sustainable um, kind of ongoing way. And for some, it was more on the environmental side of that sustainability, but really it's, it's kind of this fusion between um, kind of the, the peace studies, the international relations and in, in institutions and economics together that, that made up global affairs. And I think it, the, the bedrock foundational principle underneath all of these for the Keough School, and I, I think this is certainly the case for myself, is that the idea of integral human development. And this Catholic idea that says that when we're talking about 
development, we're talking about the human person, we really need to be intentional to include the full person. Um, and so that when we're thinking about development, we're not just talking about GDP, but, and we're not even just thinking about, you know, health and education outcomes, we're really thinking about the whole person. Um, and that, that affects both what the kind of the key indicators that you're looking at as you're doing policymaking are, but also the ways that you interact with those persons and the way that you, you know, kind of utilize human centered design um, to really keep the human person and as an individual with dignity at the center of that. Um, in terms of my, my interest, um, I love learning. My, my ideal activity is sitting in the sun reading, uh, whether it's, you know, kind of a, a long form magazine or whether it's, it's a book, fiction, nonfiction, I love it all. And so as a child, you know, it is a, it's a big world. And so if you like to learn, learning about the world and all the places beyond where you are, um, it's, just, it's an exciting place to go out and learn. Um, and so I think because I spent just so much time reading and, and learning about different places, you know, whether it's the culture, the geography, you know, the history as a child, I think that just made it so that that's kind of how my brain is wired. Uh, you know, I was really fortunate that um, I was a knucklehead as, as a teenager. Neither of my parents went to college, um, but they're both, you know, they're both smart people who just didn't have those opportunities. And you know, my mother was one of nine on a dairy farm and my dad, you know, kind of came from a, from a labor family kind of in the inner ring of Milwaukee. Um, and just, so neither went to college. And so, um, but they valued education. They really pushed me when I had, I had no interest in education. And um, I really lucked out that through a, a teacher who, who, you know, gave me a little extra care and through some nudging from my mother, I ended up taking advanced placement economics in high school. And I was taking all these AP classes, again, still no interest in going to college. Um, and I had the most wonderful teacher who, who now, as, as I've, you know, furthered my economics education, I, I certainly have some, some things I disagree with him on, but uh, I had an incredible economics teacher who really changed my life and, and opened my eyes up to kind of some of these systematic ways of thinking and analyzing the world. That teacher went on to become Congressman Kurt Bills of Minnesota. He, uh, he lost to um, Klobuchar in her last, maybe her last, maybe it was two re-elections ago, but, you know, he was, oh. he was kind of a rising, a rising star enough that he, you know, he won the, this Republican nomination for the Senate. Um, and that was, that was my, that was the first, my first economics teacher way back when. Um, I would like to make uh, one point and then another question, if I may. Uh, you're talking about the integral development and sustainable development. Um, in the Back in the good old days, 1970s and 80s, Latin America, the term used by Christian Democrats was integral development. We never used sustainable development because the connotation was more materialist. In other words, the center was... Um, the human person. So with that was not only economic development, but also political development and uh, religious freedom and so on. Those, um, uh, that generation is already gone and was replaced in the 90s and uh, the year 2000, uh, sustainable development, uh, particularly pushed by United Nations and other international agencies. Uh, now, having said that, there was also um, an interest, international um, interest of the United States in the 60s to push this uh, agenda with uh, beginning with John F. Kennedy Alliance for Progress, which has precisely um, inject some awareness about development in Latin America, I'm talking about Latin America in general, um, instead of um, revolutionary changes and uh, that was in 1960s, uh, the time of uh, 50s and 60s of uh, guerrilla fighting all over the continent. So that idea was the key word in order to counter that was development. But the debate was whether that development was an integral development or another type of development. That's why I'm saying this uh, Christian Democrat held this idea that was integral development. Now, today, all this um, memory, if you will, is gone. Not many people know that. Um, now, how do you see today the relationship between 
a hegemonic power, the US. And some region you may call Africa, Latin America in terms of uh, um, international help or promotion or what a word that is being used today, empower them in this area. Are we still talking about integral development, sustainable development? Um, what is the situation do you think now? Yeah, that's, that's uh, quite a question. I think, you know, in terms of kind of why, looking back at the, the beginning of your question, the interplay between sustainable development and integral human development, I think that you're correct to say, you know, these are, these are not the same thing. And I, and I fully agree with you, but there is, I think there is some overlap. And I think that overlap means that practitioners of, of one or the other, um, and certainly practitioner, practitioners of both, should um, see each other as allies. And so the two should, should work hand in hand to advance the common good. When we think about you know, kind of the latter half of, of, of the question, the role of, of this hegemonic power, I think, that, I think that within your question, you kind of note that there should be certain trepidation as, as a foreign power in a, in, a, in a powerful foreign entity how one enters into arrangements and agreements, relationship and partnership that is ordered toward, whether we're talking about sustainable development, whether we're talking about integral human development or whether we're talking about kind of a, a policy program that is a fusion of the two, the way that that relationship occurs needs to be very careful. I would say, and I, this is, I think, both based on kind of academic research and first-hand experience on the ground that the state, the United States in this case, is probably not the best agent to be implementing these policies in these forms of development on the ground. I think the United States is an essential player in conversations about um, priorities. So I think in many ways, the United States potentially should, should reduce its voice to create more space for those states um, from, you know, from the developing world so that they can, you know, have more voice there. And I think certainly in conversations of funding and coordination and in building coalitions, I think is where the United States, you know, federal government, uh, and as well as other, you know, large, powerful international um, bodies, uh, states, where they should be operating. But the actual implementation on the ground, I think, is best done by organizations. Um, and if you look at a lot of organizations, especially over the last 10, 20 years, there's been a really intentional move to not just be, oh, we're Oxfam, we're Catholic Relief Services, we're going to show up and we're going to do the agenda that was set out by our board of directors in some boardroom, you know, on top of a tower, but rather that they're coming in and they're often partnering with, you know, members of the community organizations that have risen out of that community. And there's a lot more listening. There's a lot more, you know, saying, you know, hey, here's the proposal, here's what we see. How does that jive with you? What would you identify as your needs? And I think that leads to a lot more intentional policy making. And it often leads to policy results, whether in the actual policy program that's written out, as well as in the results, results that are different than what, say, myself as someone kind of with this academic, economic background would, would plot out um, or, you know, what the funders and members of the board may act out, but is much more representative of, you know, the desires of that population. A, a lot of my research and some of my work with Catholic Relief Services was related to financial inclusion with refugees. And so I was working with the Rohingya population that, that crossed the, the border from Myanmar into Bangladesh, as well as South Sudanese refugees who are in Northern Uganda. Um, and we find is, you know, there's, there's a lot of push for, for digital financial inclusion. And there, there are populations where digital financial inclusion is essential and it's, it is world and community changing. It's drastically can raise, um, quality of life and well-being in those communities. But there also are places and in, in members of those, for, you know, members of those communities for whom a focus on digital financial inclusion and really even a focus on tradition, traditional Western understandings of financial inclusion actually is detrimental to the development of those communities. Um, there's lots of parts of the world where 
people would much rather, you know, receive a conditional cash transfer or like a cash for work type arrangement with a nonprofit. We would rather receive payment in goats rather than having a bank account set up and having the nonprofit do all this work so that there's, you know, kind of banking on wheels or mobile money type arrangements because where they come from, um, whether it's because of inflation or, you know, access to capital or, or you know, security or financial literacy, the goats are actually be a much better store of money. Or, or you know, there was one, one kind of community I worked in where, um, you know, cash isn't, you know, you couldn't, you know, have your children get married, you know, using cash dowries. Like it actually mattered for their, the, you know, ability to find partners for your children, goats, right? But no, no committee, or at least certainly no committee 15, 20 years ago that's planning their development policy is going to choose goats as kind of their means, right? Because we want to connect these people to banks, financial institutions. Let's think about capital flows versus capital hops. Um, you know, and we see that kind of thing all over where, um, our good intentions that we may have as practitioners and folks from the West, and, and certainly the US government, as we think about some of their priorities, don't match the incentives and needs of those populations. So I'm not, I'm not sure if that, that answers your question, question well, but that's kind of some of my thoughts as I think about that interplay between how should the United States as, you know, as you said, a hegemonic institution interact with these concepts of development and you know, people, real, right? real people, not just communities, not just, you know, numbers on, on a Gini coefficient table, but real people in other places. You know, that's very helpful. Uh, Christopher is uh, our foremost localist, and uh, you've uh, had an international perspective, but you've already emphasized a local testimony and how important that is. Uh, Christopher, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, listening to what you've been saying, my question would be this. Does development have an objective goal? In other words, when we talk about development, whether it's integral or not, are we, is, there, is there a goal to which we can say that all societies should be moving or is it merely, do we merely judge what is development based upon the peculiar peculiarities of that society? It's peculiar culture, it's peculiar religion, um, et cetera. Um, is it, in other words, is, would, 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 would it be right to say, it sounds like what many things you're talking about are things which some missionary groups try to do. But missionary groups have obviously, at least they have had, a goal of conversion, say, whether it be the Catholic faith, the Protestant faith, or whatever, Muslim. Um, what is the difference between that kind of development and the kind of development you're referring to? I don't think there necessarily needs to be a difference. Um, and again, I think this gets at, at that idea that integral human development and sustainable development are not the same thing, but there is an interplay. And in different organizations, we'll kind of pick different spots along that spectrum, along that Venn diagram for, for where they operate. And, and organizations that I've worked with certainly have, um, as someone who's you know, kind of done humanitarian work under a missionary umbrella, done, you know, potentially some missions work under a humanitarian umbrella, as well as kind of approach it from a more public policy standpoint. I, as I, as I hear you ask that question, I feel a tension inside of me because I do, you know, as someone who has spent a lot of time building economic models um, and a lot of time, you know, reading UN documents where I think like, well, no, 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 like, there are certain objective standards of development. There's certain, you know, kind of a universal direction that we that we're moving in. But I think that there are extreme limitations that come when one takes up that viewpoint and becomes too blinded by kind of their vision and their dogma that they put around development. I I reflect on the. Um, The teachings of Amartya Sen. Um, are, are you guys can nod or thumbs up? Are you guys familiar with Amartya Sen? Yes. Okay. So, so, so he's, right. my, he's my brother-in-law. No. Oh. I just say, I was say, hot, hot no. dog, small world. Uh, <laughs> it's not that small. It's not that small, Tony. Go ahead. Well, so, so you know, Amartya Sen has, has this capabilities approach that that really frames development. In, and I actually think that Amartya Sen is kind of a perfect figure to help us think about the bridge between integral human development and sustainable development. 
Um, you know, Marty Ascend's capabilities approach really says, how can we create the freedoms so that people have the capability to actualize these development needs? And so those individuals may not choose to actualize those freedoms, but we should ensure they have the capability to actualize them. And so, for example, um, someone may, you know, someone may or may not own a bike, but we should ensure they have the capability to, you know, own a bike and, and utilize it. Someone may not choose to go, you know, to high, receive higher education, go to college, but we should have our society structured in such a way that if someone was chose to, you know, gain that freedom, that what I would say is both a personal and public good, they should have the capability to receive that both in terms of um, their, you know, previous public formation and education accommodations that may be made because of differences in ability they may have. And I think certainly when we talk about from the United States perspective, the capability to pay for um, that education. So I think that sense capability approach is a bridge that's, that is able to wrestle out what aspects of development are universal and what aspects of it are um, matching local desire, local context, local culture. Follow up, Christopher. I'll, oh. I'll just I'll just note before you you, you ask a follow up. The the most common uh, dinner table debate in my in my home between me, my wife and I is um, Amartya Sen versus John Rawls. So um, that's that's our common thread of back and forth. So I always like to be able to, to give him a positive plug. When I hear the name John Rawls, I usually do this. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I can, I, if, I don't know if I may, you said something that caught my attention. A few things, but one of these things uh, caught my attention. You talk about the common good. Now, I already believe in the common good, but um, many people and organizations who help third world countries also talk the common good, but a different common good. How then you reconcile, let's say, the help to develop, empower, you can give any name, a developing society, to achieve, flourish, respecting their own culture, if you say, when development or common good in some organization, international organization, include abortion. And I'm not talking theoretically, I'm talking to someone who once upon a time had to deal with this type of thing. In other words, many of these organizations talk about population control and sometimes abortion. How then you reconcile? Is that common good? Yeah, I think I think that we speak truth, and you know, and I think that you know, from an American Solidarity Party, and I just I don't know if we've even really talked about the party, and that's that's we can you know we can talk about it more later, but but you know I think from an, you know as a member of the party, we really root everything that we do in you know human dignity, right? And, and for me as, as, a, as a Catholic, as a person of faith, right? Like I affirm the innate dignity that's within every human. Um, and so, right, that, that leads to, there are some lines that, that we cannot cross. And so we need to speak truth. Um, and that truth is sometimes in conflict with the agendas of some organizations, agendas that sometimes are put under a common good umbrella. And so I think that a, we speak truth. B, we form coalitions um, as we are able and on issues that we're able. And so there are times when I, you know, an organization that may be pro abortion, an organization that is anti abortion, they can work together on ending hunger, right? Because they can both see human dignity, they both see, you know, people who are hungry, and they can both work toward ending that. And so I think that just because one of those organizations is, is pro-population control or abortion and the other is not, 
doesn't, doesn't mean that uh, they shouldn't be able to work together. Point three, third point, is that Hold Rick Perry, lost it. Um. That's okay because Christopher Zender had a follow-up question that got lost. And so two losses make a gain. Perfect. <laughs> I'm not sure if um, my follow-up question is a very different from what um, Mario said. But when we talk about the common good, we're talking about something which is more than economics, right? We're talking about even something which is more than the dignity of human life. We're talking about culture. We're talking about ultimately religion. Um, how do you, I mean, how does one in, in a world like this work with international organizations where the, that notion of the common good is gonna be, there's gonna be profound differences between that notion of the common good on the, on the cultural and finally on the religious and philosophical level. Um, we can, we can, we can uh, even, even like when you talk about economics, I would think you have to first define what is good for human beings before you can talk about what economic system is good for human beings. I mean, in, in the United States, we define um, a good economic system is one that gives us more stuff. But is that what actually makes for true human development? More stuff on the higher level. So how do you how do you um, come to how do how do we work together on an international level um, with regimes and ideas and organizations which have a very different ultimate different view of what the common good entails? No, that's that, that's a great question, and and it's I'm glad that you asked that follow up because actually it reminded me of what my third point to the previous uh, question uh, was because uh, uh, I think that point three is actually how I would answer your question. Listening is really important when working, you know, either with a population who who maybe desires something that we would identify as not actually being part of the common good, or when you're working with an organization that as part of their agenda is you know propagating and advocating something that, that is outside of the scope of the common good, um, say abortion. As uh, listening and understanding, what are the values behind that desire? Um, in, in, you know, in many cases, if it's in the population, what are the fears, the challenges, the difficulties? Um, in, in, from the organizational standpoint, what are the motivations? What, do you, what is the goals that you're trying to achieve, the values and virtue, you know, or, or perceived virtues that you're seeking by implementing this policy that is not actually um, affirming the dignity of the human person. And so in doing that, we can actually find common spaces where we can work um, and find alternatives to some of these policies that are being put forth. You know, in the, in the case of abortion, there are <laughs> pro-abortion groups and anti-abortion groups that actually there's this, a fairly large space of policies that would reduce the demand of, for abortion that both of these organizations can support. And so I think that when working with either these organizations or, or people who desire things that are outside the common good, I think that that listening and understanding motivation, desires, fears, and needs is really important to be able to find spaces um, for, for commonality that where there is a common understanding of the common good and a, that reflects the true common good as well as um, opportunities for alternate policies. Um, and so that may, and, and you, can, you can push a little more if that doesn't kind of get at the core of your question of how do we work with these organizations. But I do think that that, I think that when, both when we think on the macro level, kind of strategically, and we think kind of on the, the interpersonal level, I do think that that kind of listening and understanding actually is an, plays an essential role in our policy making. I'd like to go ahead um, at two levels. Uh, first, I want to get your comment on an individual, individual person. And then I want to go back to, to the common good and integral human fulfillment. One of our listeners, uh, I pretty sure that he's uh, from India, uh, has asked about an individual who served as a missionary 
and worked many decades with uh, Hill people. And I happen to have had a long standing conversation with uh, another person, I don't think he's a missionary, I think he's a Catholic priest in Bangladesh who works with Hill people there. At any rate, this individual's name is uh, Father Stan Swami. And he was arrested and uh, a number of interventions were made on his behalf. And 84 years old, he died in prison. Um, I guess my question on, on this individual could be something like, how is it that we can ever get to the truth of what happened, why it happened, and how can we respond? Yeah, uh, that, that'd, be, that'd be tricky, right? I think there are times when we can't get at the truth. And so we, I think we have to say, what do we know? Uh, and for the spaces where we don't know things for sure, what does the preponderance of evidence say? Um, and I'm I'm not uh, an expert on on the, the case of Father Stan, though I you know seeing kind of some of the chat earlier today about it, you know did I did read you know CNN story and, and kind of thought about some of the, what I know about that context, um, you know, and it, it seems like right the preponderance of evidence says that you know these are charges that have absolutely nothing to do with this work of this individual, this individual who you know, was advocating on behalf of people who don't really have people advocating for them, folks who, um, at least based on kind of the basic research and even even what, you know, CNN was sharing, folks who um, face a lot of hardship and, and face opposition from their own government, a government that's, you know, increasingly, often is increasingly becoming nationalist. And so I think that to know the truth of what actually occurred, I think would require us to, to have you know, the beatific vision to know, you know, what was in the mind of the person who, who made the arrest order? What was in the mind of kind of the, some of the judicial folks who were reviewing some of the appeals saying, you know, this is an 84 year old with Parkinson's, um, you know, can we please approve this medical order even if they're still being incarcerated? Um, you know, I don't think that we could ever know the full story of that situation until unless we could know their hearts but we can say without knowing their hearts and say, you know, here are, here are the motivations, here are the patterns of behavior surrounding this. Here's the information we know, such as, you know, Father Stan was nowhere near the place where the alleged terroristic actions happened and say that, you know, this seems to be an abuse of power um, that is motivated by um, political interests rather than um, truth, rather than the actual common good and rather than certainly the good of individual persons. I see. All right. Now I'm going to formally request Mario and Christopher to be whistleblowers because I want to return to the common good in a way that might very well uh, lapse into ruminations. It, it might even be untethered ruminations, but I want to connect with a, a few points that were made leading to our discussion of the common good. Uh, first point, this will be the briefest, has to do with John Rawls. I think if you were to ask John Rawls, now the late John Rawls, uh, are you interested in the common good? I think he would say, well, I am, but the way to advance the common good is to follow a certain process, a certain procedure. Otherwise, you'll fall into metaphysics. But of course, Rawls himself could not avoid the metaphysics of the person. He, uh, for all practical purposes, argued that there was no way to argue in the uh, public sector against abortion. Uh, and I think that in the end, he held that view because he thought that uh, one would be doing metaphysics if one were to do such a thing as that. And uh, that's one reason why when all is said and done, I, I can't take somebody like Rawls seriously. Now then we turn to Sen and the capabilities approach. It's interesting, you're a reader, keep it up. 
keep it up until your eyes, <laughs> like my eyes. Uh, uh, Martha Nussbaum, the very influential American philosopher, has joined with Sen in advancing the capabilities approach. And I think one benefit of the capabilities approach is that it, it removes us from some sort of uh, lust for mathematical equality. Uh, instead of saying of such and such a state of affairs at a given point, uh, well, it looks like this group isn't equal to that group. What we ought to be looking for is whether the capabilities across the board are being recognized and honored. And the capabilities approach certainly connects with the notion of integral human fulfillment, at which point I want to say something out of reverence to, uh, for my longtime teacher, Germaine Brise. Uh, shortly after Vatican II, uh, Grise put forward, uh, not entirely uh, de novo, but in a brilliantly original way, the new natural law theory. And he understood uh, the common good in terms of integral human fulfillment. And he used that expression, which is taken from the documents of the Vatican II, repeatedly and early on. Uh, now, when we come to the common good, uh, can it ever be the case that we can speak of a, a universal common good? And, and Christopher's talked about how we have to have in mind what counts as the good of the person uh, if we're going to talk about the common good. And someone like Grise would say that the common good is the whole range of material and cultural preconditions that enable us to realize the basic goods where the basic goods are the core constituents of human, across the board, human flourishing. Goods like, and the common doctor, St. Thomas identifies them, uh, the good of knowledge, the good of truth, the good of social harmony, uh, the good of sexual community, uh, the good of a kind of an openness to the sacred. And uh, it seems to me that if we're going to have a universal church, we absolutely have to address a common good that is the common good of the human person. And uh, in doing so, we certainly respect cultures because, uh, well, the way I would present the common good, it's the whole range of material and cultural preconditions necessary to promote and realize the basic goods, which basic goods are themselves the core constituents of human flourishing. I don't know what you'd make of that framework, but I think we have to have something as comprehensive uh, as that, uh, at least in the back of our minds. Yeah, you know, I think that that part of part of the challenge is part of my, you know, my wife and I's back and forth on on Rawls and Sen is, you know, values are important, virtues are important, and they're lofty and, and they're true. But when you're in the trenches or in a refugee camp, you need to be, it needs you need to be able to do something actionable. And so those those principles can steer your actions, but if your, your formula or your process around those principles is, is something that can't actually be implemented in the real world, then they're not actually serving those, those values and those principles. Um, you know, someone who, um, you know, I guess I, I hold in a, in, a, to a, in a similar level of esteem or thought as, as Martha Nussbaum is Sabine Alkire, who, who's another student of Amartya Sen. She's, she's in Oxford. Um, and she's done a lot of work in terms of, you know, building multidimensional poverty indexes. Um, and I think that, that you correctly point out a risk when you find a way to quantify this stuff is that you can just say like, okay, we've got this number, we've got this number, this is their difference. You know, we inject, you know, these three things in this ratio, and it should change that so that these people are, are equal, right? And so I think that there needs to be a role for not just discussing equality, but also equity and inclusion. 
um, as, we, as we think about society, as we think about the common good. But I do think that despite this limitation, despite this temptation that we need to be aware of to overly quantify and then just turn it into, you know, a, an abacus game of, of, you know, moving digits around, I do think that there is an important role for ensuring that we can make our understanding of the common good actionable, or at least that we have a pathway that is actionable in, in a real way in actual humans' lives yes, yes, toward indeed. that value. Most, most certainly that's the case. And if we understand the common good in, in terms of, well, not totally, but in terms of uh, the material conditions for something that's almost always actionable as getting decent, clean water. It's actionable in California. It's actionable in the less developed countries throughout the world. But, but now, um, you mentioned the American Solidarity Party once. We do have a quota system, Tony. We like to mention it at least seven times, seven being a perfect number. We like to mention it at least seven times in, in every show. And Christopher holds a public office and is a member of the American Solidarity Party and was instrumental in drafting the principles of the American Solidarity Party. So I wonder if, Christopher, you could kind of direct our line of discussion in the direction of the party. Right. Um, well, um, yes, it's true. I am. I am a. I'm. A, I'm not. I, I'm an elected official, not because I have been elected yet, but uh, I will be running for, re for election this fall. And it'll probably be elected because no one else will be running. And you're a card-carrying member, but you've lost your card. That's right. Yeah, I lost lots of things in my time, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, the, the ASP, so what, what do you think, uh, my mind is going now too, I guess my question before that would be uh, just maybe a clarifying question from what, some of the things you said about what's actionable. Um, it almost seemed to be, you almost seemed to me to be saying that when we're dealing with very basic human needs, such as people who are in refugee situations. We don't really, we might have certain principles, moral principles and the like, which guide us, but yet they're not really things which are what the people at that time need. What they need is maybe clean water or good food or shelter. Um, and so we, I, I, I don't think you probably meant this, but I, I, the sense I got was that we, we, for the time being, we set those aside to look at other things. And, to, and at least to my mind, um, I understand that when you are, say, changing a baby's diaper, you're not necessarily engaging in in, um, in, uh, in catechesis, right? And when you're, you're trying to when you're trying to clean do people clean water, you're not engaged in philosophical discussions with them. That's all true. But you know, in every but if if if, if the, what is true about man, what is true about um, the human person. And what is our, what, what is the good of the human person is that it would still guide the decisions you make, even in those practical affairs, wouldn't it? And you, these, and the decision making these practical affairs are what you want to establish on the practical level would be seen as stepping stones towards the full development that you, these people need to attain. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, 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 that, that makes sense. Yeah, to, I mean, to be, to be, clear um you know maybe separate than than Rawls or kind of you know have a put a quantitative economist shoes on right in, in the case of you know changing the baby's diaper um you know you could get so if, if you have got you know as a quantitative economist um you could you know have kind of the perfect mathematical model that's that's charting kind of dynamic shifts in utility um but if it's going to take you you know six hours to to do this process plot out you know all the math behind it, right? Like you're not actually meeting the bait that needs that baby and you're not actually good, right? It doesn't matter what your utility calculation says six years later, right? It's going to be out of date and you're not actually going to have, you know, increase anyone's utility, right? I'm not a utilitarian, but like, like but if a utilitarian was in this case, right? Their print, their, their 
process actually would be preventing them from carrying out their principles. Um, you know, in the case where you're, you know, but if you say like changing the baby, right? This, I'm, our value here is love. I'm gonna act in love. I know that it is good for this baby to have their diaper changed separate from whatever the utility calculation says, right? I take the actual actionalizable step. And so, so what, what I mean there is, is not saying, you know, we should put our principles aside, but rather saying that sometimes, um, and this is, you know, for me, I think part of my critique of kind of a Rawlsian system of, of building a just society. And I think like, it's great in a vacuum, but you don't have time to, you know, do those calculations, work through that process, um, a very sterile process in a messy world. And so when we have a messy world, I think that the you know, capabilities approach type system where I can see a person, I can hear from them what their needs, desires, hopes, fears are. And then we can make, and we meaning not me an institution, but we meaning me and that person can then you know, make steps, whether it is in policy, whether it is in simple acts of love to increase those capabilities. That's kind of, that's if that's more clear. Maybe, but what if the person says, look, my problem is I have too many children. And I think I need to, something needs to be done to keep me from having any more children. But you're a Catholic and you can't just say, okay, well, okay, we'll bring in some contraceptives. Yeah, um, and, I, and I think that that's, that gets back to this, you know, this aspect of listening, right? Because, some, you know, their, their immediate thing that someone is going to share as, you know, here's my need, here's my hope, here's my fear is I have too many children, right? But what are, what are the reasons why having too many children is a problem, right? And there, there's a variety of reasons that that could be, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's, you know, about financial, whether it's about food, whether it's about access to, you know, education resources, whether it's about, you know, not wanting to become pregnant as, you know, an individual has a right to, but having, for example, a, you know, domestic partner who, you know, is, is abusive and not receptive to someone, you know, making a statement about their, um, their consent. And so I think that then we can look at what are the actual um, challenges at play and there are solutions to most of the responses to that question that not only can be carried out, you know, kind of within Catholic morality, but actually Catholic morality would say these solutions are actually good in terms of, you know, finding, you know, finding solutions that alleviate these pressures and make it so that those children can, you know, have the need, you know, receive their needs and, and be fully loved. It is possible that person may give answers that are outside of um, the realm of what I as a Catholic or, or as what a Catholic institution could carry out, right? And so I think that there, there are situations where one could reach an impasse on kind of final solution and, and one then can't participate in that part of the solution, but just because they can't participate in that part of the solution, you know, the provision of contraceptives doesn't mean that there are not ways that me as a person or as an institution um, could meet other needs that are expressed in that conversation around um, that need that can't be fulfilled. Let me quick uh, raise a low tech problem that I'm suffering from now. I am using one of my son's laptops and it's not showing the time. And we are constantly going over. So if somebody could give me the time. 449. 49. So in theory, we have 11 minutes. Oftentimes Mario has to do a splitsville. I don't know if this afternoon is one, but we're it's thinking okay. in terms, oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Okay. I'm thinking in terms of 10, 15 minutes left. And I really think we ought to be talking as much now as we can about the American Solidarity Party Mario, would you like to take us forward? Well, um, <laughs> I think the, the question is, uh, is precisely what led you to join the American Solidarity Party. And after that, I have uh, <clears throat> a comment, depend on your answer. What led you to join the American Solidarity Party? What did you find unique in the American Solidarity Party? 
Yeah. So, so growing up, I grew up in a, in a split political home, uh, in a home in which my, my parents would, would argue politics and debate politics. Um, you know, it's, it, was a, it was a home, you know, our basement growing up was kind of decorated in, in pro-labor and strike memorabilia. And, and my father, you know, participated in strikes while I was, you know, living at home as, as a child. Um, and so, you know, because I kind of heard, heard these dynamics of, of left and right from my parents, I never um, affiliated with either party um, growing up or, or as a, a young adult, you know, I, there were times in certain races where I caucused as a Democrat, there were races where I was helping the Republican campaign uh, at the local level. Um, but I'm, I was always excited by alternative ideas, even, even if they weren't necessarily viable, the pursuit of something better. And I'm, I am an optimist um, and, and I don't know if I'd say I'm, a, I'm an idealist, but I'm certainly, I'm certainly an optimist. I'm certainly um, believe that we can do things better and a better world is possible. Um, to, to quote Pope Francis in the Laudato Si, truly much can be done. And so I get excited by attempts to do better. And so that's kind of why I was, I was always on the prowl for, you know, th what are third parties doing? What are maybe politicians that are in total lockstep with what their party says? What are some of the policy ideas they're coming up with? And that's why I kind of had, you know, I certainly I wasn't happy with the options in the 2016 election. And that's why my ears were open and, you know, I'm constantly reading. And so in, in 2016, in that, that setting, there was a number of news, art, news stories about the American Solidarity Party. In particular, several that um, Father Dwight Longnecker had put out in Crux and in some other sources. And uh, First Things, um, which back then I, I read more than I do now, they had, you know, had a whole piece. I think it was David, McF David McPherson had a whole piece on the American Solidarity Party. And I found it totally intrigued, um, you know, a lot closer than any party that I'd ever seen before for me. And it was a platform that was chock full of big ideas that were trying to do things better. You know, I hadn't, I'd heard of distributism during my conversion to Catholicism, um, but I had never seen anyone try and do it. And I had, you know, years of economics training and I'd never heard anyone talk about, you know, kind of Georgia's style economic policies like the land value tax and these things. I didn't know if they were, you know, the final answer, um, but I knew that they were conversations that were worth having that the, would bear fruit long-term in terms of the good of our country. And so I did, I voted for um, Mike Matern and, and Juan Munoz in um, 2016, continued to watch the party uh, for a few months after, and then in early 2017 joined the party. Uh, and within, within a few months, I was um, volunteering as the chair in Washington state and, you know, continuously since. Okay, Mario. So you see then, or you saw, in American Solidarity Party, big ideas, so that by observing those ideas, then you join it because you think those ideas may be uh, instrumental in changing the situation we are in now. And and I knew that I can support right this movement, um, right? I I you know, and I I don't necessarily agree with every word, but I grew within the, in the platform and some of the, you know, some of the policies are policies in the platform I could support, but I think there may be a better way to do it. Um, but I can stand by our principles um, and our goals and our coalition in the values and the solidarity that's behind it. Um, and so that's, you know, not only was there big ideas, but there also was this place where um, I can participate in its movement toward a better world and a better country. Christopher, what, what, um, what are some of the challenges you think the party faces? You talk about, um, you don't agree with everything the platform. I don't think any, anybody does agree with everything in the platform. But um, are there ideological battles that within the party which prevent a challenge or are those pretty much taken care of? I, I had an interview with, a, with another newspaper yesterday and they, they asked a similar question. And, and I guess for me, the focus is not on, on differences, but rather on tensions. And if I think if we look at history, um, especially in the, you know, within the church, there are times when there was tensions and in the moments when there was a tension, but there was still a solidarity, um, whether with persons or with key ideas or with the institution, 
those tensions ended up bearing fruit. They ended up bearing reforms. They ended up bearing um, innovations that, that improved those institutions and, and the societies around them. And so while, while there are, you know, certainly policy differences, I actually think that that tension is, is kind of essential to the identity and the mission and who we are as a party. Um, I think that the moment that we lose those, those tensions, we become a monolith. And I think that we um, lose some of our ability to strike and make a difference and, and claim an identity within our kind of political landscape. Um, I think that much bigger than tensions around specific policies um, or kind of you know, ideological debates within the party, I think that the much bigger challenge to the party is the long road to electoral reform, right? We, we are a political party. We can have, I think we can and, and have seen the ability to have success at the local level. We are growing in our capability to have success at the state level. And I think that, you know, long-term this, you know, as you get more and more places where we have strength and successes at the local and state level, right, it becomes success at the nat national level. But electoral reform is, is an essential part of that. And I think that great progress is being made on that. But I think that that's a much bigger challenge. I think, you know, things like campaign finance and, and the amount of money we have um, is a great challenge. Um, but I think that the response of the party to both of these challenges and saying, you know, rather than being a flash in the pan, like some other third parties or, you know, flashy candidates that are built around, you know, one person or one, you know, bank account, we're a party that, that is grassroots. And so we may not have as much money, but we have this strong base and a base both in terms of people and money that is growing. We, in terms of, you know, we have challenges electorally just because of, you know, our current political system, but chip by chip, we're knocking that down. And we have a strong coalition that is dedicated in, in continuing to grow and build momentum even when new barriers are put in our way. Final thoughts, Mario? Well, um, it's very interesting, your optimism. Um, <laughs> but this is my, my, this is my question. Perhaps it's my own, um, my own question. I leave my question, which relate to what you said before about principles and actions. In the party, we have ideas and actions. So the challenge, I think, should be, and, and it, we also mentioned about the church, the Catholic social teaching has principles, and then are, they are actions. So I think the challenge is to find how then we go about and make those principles really being alive. And how then the principle in which I believe really I not consider themselves theoretical rather than part of my life. You touch a word which I think he in order to understand any Christian Democratic Party, sometimes very often we forget. The party ought not to be a machine, a political machine, otherwise it's going to die. Should be a movement. Movement means something that is alive. And if we I have, encounter- have a culture. It's, it's alive, more than a culture. It's alive, like Christian, being Christian is being alive. Christ is present. Now, if we have this experience, because I cannot teach you about that, other than I can invite you, you encounter that. So that is why I'm very skeptic about people saying, well, I joined the party for ideas. I never joined a party for ideas. I joined party for the people to whom I saw living in certain way that attract me. It's a life, it's a witness. That is what I think a movement is. We can, of course, after that, we can organize, we can have all the campaign, of course, but those things will follow only if we have life. 
In other words, I can work with some agnostic people in some organization. Yes, unless you also have a community who is alive and leave those principles. They are in me. Otherwise, it's a question of ideas, and that is the trap of modernity. What I'm saying is, I think, that's my interpretation, what caused the destruction of all Christian Democratic Party in the world so far. You can go anywhere and see what happened. You see the rise, the Senate, the climax, and then the decline. When it starts losing this vibrant sort of life, then they become ideological and then they die. No matter how much money they have. That's my, my rant for today. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there definitely are aspects of that, that that I agree with, but there definitely are parts that I disagree with. And I, and I can, I mean, speaking for myself, right? You know, you said no one gets involved and, in, you know, joins the party. No one joins the movement because of ideas. Um, but I, I joined this movement because of ideas. I think that no one becomes indebted isn't the right word. Um, you know, no one, there's a stage, right? There, I think there are, there are stages of, of level of commitment, right? And I think that both commitment to the institutional aspect of it, but I think also, I think you're really correct to point this out, commitment to the principles of it. Um, the values of the institution. And I think you're right that that's really key for the living nature of it, especially when you have an uphill climb, right? If that's not deep and, and part of who the, the person is and part of, you know, really lived out in what they're doing, right? Like, you know, it's, it's going to be the seed that, that was planted in the shallow soil. Um, you know, it sprout up fast, but it's, it's going to burn away and not, not, you know, bear any fruit, not have any roots. So I think that I think that from an American Solidarity Party standpoint, um, and, and I think this is actually really relevant to some of our conversations around how we're using and expanding our use of media, that ideas are are important for getting folks in the door, getting folks paying attention, and making folks be open to either learning about and then making those principles part of who they are, or if those principles are already part of who they are, already part of their value set. To, to really kind of lock them in place and have them really turn them on and, and engage in the movement. And so um, I guess I wanna, I wanna push back on, on that part of it though, though I think that your, your you know, general analysis of, you know, this needs to be something that's living. And if it becomes a machine or a monolith, um, or, you know, I think something that um, is really striated between, you know, leadership and people um, and really separate, I think that you're right, like that it loses that life and then you know, without that vibrancy, um, a movement like ours can't stand against the, um, I don't want to use the term evil, but um, the, the intransigence in challenges of modernity and certain, certainly politics within modernity. Some people do read their way into the party, and some people do read their way into the church. And some people are like Dorothy Day. They joined the church because it was the church of the poor. And she was with the poor. And she saw how central to the lives of the poor the church was. And some people uh, emphasize, I think of Charles Foucault for one, uh, being present, being present with people. And Pope Francis speaks often of accompanying people. And you have to be there in person to accompany them. But of course, when you accompany them, you speak with them. And what do you say? What do you say? Well, we could go back to St. Paul, who uh, in accompanying people, uh, developed a awe-inspiring Christology and <laughs> shared it with them. Uh, and it was difficult and 
Peter tells us that, yes, people have mentioned to him that sometimes Paul is hard to understand. But Paul put his life on the line. And so I think the word, witness, presence, and, and articulation are, are part of the integral life of the church. And I think they'll be integral to the party as well. We, we come now to our, our closing with the gospel for today, which is, is so often the case, uh, very clearly a statement of a two-edged sword that is at the heart of the faith. This is from Matthew. Jesus said to his apostles, Behold, I am sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will be led before governors and kings for my sake, as a witness before them and pagans. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. You will be given at that moment what you are to say, for it will not be you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will hand over brother to death, and father is child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but whoever endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to another. Amen. I say to you, you will not finish the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Sebastian Mafud will send us the recording. He always does. All Wonderful. right. Well, thank, thank you guys very much for having me. It's, it's a stimulating conversation. Yeah. All right. You are very stimulating for us, that's for sure. Godspeed. Take care. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.